Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simon, like diamonds, back again. We're talking about conservation. I got my boy Justin. What's up, buddy? What's going on, brother? And a special guest, Captain Travis Thompson. Um, we talked about it offline. Perhaps the first time we've had someone who graduated, also graduated, because I did, and so did Luke from Winter Haven High School, and uh, and shockingly knows more about conservation than anyone I've talked to here this uh, this month. Um, so welcome to the show, brother. Hey, Blue Devil for life, right? That's yes. that's, that's the thing. <laughs> Blue Devil for life. Yes, what a small world. Um, and real quick, kind of introduce yourself. Tell us about your background, what you're doing. You also have a, a very awesome podcast. So uh, give that a shout out. Yeah. So, so my name is Travis Thompson. I'm, you mentioned Captain Travis Thompson. I've had my fishing guides license, my, my captain's license since 2005. Um, but we actually, we didn't talk about this off here. You and I fish a lot of the same areas. I grew up fishing Charlotte Harbor out of Little Gasparilla Island. Like those, that's my home waters. Um, I run the biggest waterfowl hunting operation in the state of Florida and between fishing, hunting, I kind of got really passionate about the idea that we need to be taking better care of these resources. If we're going to continue to, I'll say in my terms, exploit them. Like I use ducks, I use fish, like I'm, I'm making money off of them. So we got to do a better job of taking care of those resources. So, um, I run the cast and blast Florida podcast, and we're about to launch a new podcast called all Florida. That's going to go with our nonprofit that kind of is some of the stuff we will talk about today, the idea of landscape conservation and conservation at a big level, but Florida native, um, since my family's been here since 1870, love this state. When we go on vacation, we don't go other places. We go places in Florida and, um, just in love with Florida and want more people to fall in love with her. Like I am. Love it, man. Well, we were texting, you know, prior to this, just we knew it was going to be something about conservation and you just, you'd said landscape conservation. I'll be honest. My first thought was going back to an interview that we did with Orca. We were talking about individual landscape in our yard, right? Like if you lived on a canal or the ocean or even on a lake, right? If you have your beautiful St. Augustine grass all the way up to the edge of your seawall and and it's not that this is a whole lot bigger. So do you mind sharing that, that analogy, the, the kind of like the chess analogy that we'll, we'll dig into how this impacts literally, I mean, every Floridian, even if you're in Haines city, which is supposedly the dead middle of the state, what we're doing and, and on a day-to-day -day basis, right. From washing our cars to what we're doing around our houses and how we're acting and reacting can literally have an impact on our waterways for catching redfish in Tampa Bay or Port Charlotte or wherever we might be. So give that analogy, if, if you don't mind, about this bigger picture of conservation that impacts all of us. Yeah. So I, I tend to, uh, way to steal my analogy there. I tend to, uh, I tend to talk in terms of analogies all the time because it makes it, it seemingly makes it easier for me because I'm not that smart. But the idea of a chessboard is how I, I talk about this a lot. And if you're familiar with the game of chess, you got all these pieces that have different movements to them. So I describe it as, let's say redfish regulations is a rook on the chessboard and snook regulations is a pawn on the chessboard and whitetail deer regulations is a king on the chessboard. But then I'm just talking about hunting and game species. Water quality is a queen on the chessboard. And you have all these things that we all care deeply about. And we tend to stay in our lanes when we talk conservation. And we tend to only talk about you guys are friends with CCA Florida. I hear Lisa on here all the time. I love CCA. I used to work for them years and years ago. They stay in the fisheries management, the fisheries habitat. They talk well about that. They know about that, but they're not going to talk about bears. They're not going to talk about wildlife corridors because it doesn't, it's not in their lane. The idea we want to talk about is landscape conservation being all of that and beyond. Um, communities, the, the fact that, so what you were talking about with Orca, the idea that um, how you take care of your yard and your property has impacts into watersheds, uh, agriculture, agriculture gets demonized in Florida all ton. Do you guys know what's keeping houses off the landscape ranches for the most part, orange groves for the most part, I'm not saying there's no issues with runoff or anything else, but I am saying like a lot of conservation work happens on those lands through conservation easements and stuff. So the idea of landscape conservation is let's look at the whole board the state of Florida, let's look at every aspect of it, not just the, the single piece that maybe we care about on the next move. And that's not to say that I don't mean that in a reductive way at all to anything out there. And I, I picked on CCA because they're my friends. I love them to death. I'm a yeah. huge CCA proponent. And you and you still need to have, you know, kind of experts in each one of these, you know, let's just say pieces on the chessboard. Absolutely. But who who's looking at it 
from this bigger perspective, right? Who, 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 I know you're going to all kinds of different meetings and you're really involved in this kind of give us an idea. Cause I think most of us, you know, we, we probably pick one or two of our favorite nonprofits, right? There's a lot of people that will sponsor CCA or XYZ company or Ducks Unlimited and, and they forget there's all these other things happening. Who's kind of managing and, and making sure all of these different, you know, nonprofits and all these different initiatives are all kind of working together or is, or is anyone, is that part of the problem? I, I think that's part of, I won't say the problem. I think what we're seeing happen now is we're starting to see teams develop that are cross pollinating. Like, like there's an idea out there of, Oh, Travis, you've got a nonprofit. Oh, Luke, you've got it. Or Joe, you've got a nonprofit. We're competing for the same donor dollars. So we're, we're in competition with each other. I think that's starting to fall by the wayside and we're seeing more and more organizations and I'll, I'll say CCA, I'll say ASA, American Sport Fish Association. I mentioned the Florida Wildlife Corridor. I can't remember if that was all fair or not. Great organization, Conservation Florida, which is a land trust. So some of these guys that are significant pieces on this board of conservation, we're starting to see some more symbiosis between them to where we're, we're talking to each other, we're working together and we're trying to make sure we are paying attention to the impacts that this can have. Because if I, if I said to you today, salt strong, we're putting a conservation easement on a piece of property in the green swamp, you'd probably say, Oh, that's great. But I don't really care at the end of the day, how does that affect me? Cause I just want to go fishing or I want to go. And in reality, that's significantly important because that water from the green swamp is the headwaters of the Hillsborough river, which is going to turn into water in Tampa Bay, which is going to impact your redfish. It's going to impact your nursery for your grouper, your snapper, your offshore fishery. And so here locally in Polk County, there's a referendum on the ballot that most people probably don't even know about. It's referendum one, vote yes on that. But the idea is if we can't conserve and protect some of these environmentally sensitive lands, we're not going to have clean water in the future. We're not going to have places for stuff to filter across. The, the concept that Aldo Leopold, who is the father of American conservation, his land ethic was, if you take care of the land, you'll take care of the water. And I think that's a significant thing that we've got to keep in mind as we talk about this. And forgive me, I'm going to ramble for just a second more. We've also got to take into account that we have 21 and a half million people here. So we can't just say, because I love to say this, well, man, we should just lop off celebration because there's too many people there. <laughs> like, let's let's just, you know, let's cut Merritt yeah. Island in half and, and get rid of half those people. They didn't live there. We can't do that. That's not a real thing. So we also have to accommodate the needs of the people with water supply, with with food, with things like that. So it's not simply a binary, what is the best for nature? Because we are a functioning part of nature, even if it doesn't always feel good the way we look at it. Go, go back to this uh, referendum or whatever it is, number one, What what is it? You said vote yes if you're in Polk County. What, a little bit more specific, what is it? What, what is I mean, it yes to? There's a number of these around the state. And I, what, I would encourage you, like local politics is where you need to pay attention for conservation, county commissions, things like that. Like those guys, they'll get after it and develop everything we got away. And I'm not anti-development. I just, I feel like it's, it's a thing where we have to be more careful about it. But in, in Polk County specifically, this is a, a uh, property tax increase. It's 0.2 mil. So for the average Polk County homeowner, it costs you about 30 bucks a year. And it will generate roughly $300 million over the next 30 years, 20, 21 years. Um, not to get too granular, but Joe, I'm sure your family's been out to, to Circle B. Oh, that yeah. was inspired with the previous iteration of this. I mean, that's a beautiful environmental lands. We take photo, photos out there. We take tours out there. Yeah. You can see wild Florida, Samica and Polk County. There's a bunch of it that we already have. Um, and it could also be used for conservation easements, which is a little bit of a misunderstood thing because conservation easements are essentially you're working with a landowner to ensure the conservation rights are now owned by the state of that property. So a rancher, you're saying, hey, you can keep working cattle here, but we want to buy the conservation rights to ensure this doesn't become a 15,000 home development, yep. which when you put a development in, you pave everything. Yes, they have to do some mitigation through DEP for stormwater and stuff like that. But the fact is that water gets into our systems faster. If you go to the headwaters of Shingle Creek by ICAST, where the, where the conference is held every, year, held every year, all that water ends up in Shingle Creek way faster than it did 100 years ago when it was nothing but swampland. So it's not getting filtered by the ground. There's no subsurface lateral flow. There's no nutrient removal by trees and uptake by animals. Um, 
we have materially changed that. So we've got to be really cognizant of that moving forward. And I think agriculture is a huge component of that. And just this last week, the governor and cabinet signed, I think it was about 20,000 acres into conservation easement through Florida forever and rural and family land, huge conservation wind that I've seen very little talk about in the fishing community. And it's because who cares 2000 acres on a ranch or 600 acres on a parcel there. But the fact is it has huge impacts on the fishing community long-term because that water there's water that's going to get cleaned on that land and there's runoff is not going to happen off that land in the same way as if it was developed for forever that's protected for generations we won't know so it's a big deal it's a huge deal let's let's take a pause for a second because there's a a lot that happened in talking about this this bigger picture of what we're talking about here the first thing i thought when you're talking about where a lot of this movement happens is in your local government and in your county and and voting and in that moment when people go to vote it takes a couple seconds to check your boxes and the first thing i thought is everybody probably thinks that that's just not sexy like a lot of people roll their eyes and, and overlook the simplicity of that moment that just takes a couple seconds but people don't stop to really you know, gander in the big picture of everything, realize that those are crucial moments and people should take the time to listen to this podcast to understand that what you do in those moments in your local government in, in your county has an effect long term and the things that you love and enjoy and that we shouldn't take it for granted. So even though this this tends to get, you know, this this bigger picture can get lost in minutia because there's so many little things the overarching point here is that we as a community of anyone that loves Florida, loves the outdoors, land, sea, everything in between doesn't matter. You should, you should make a point to do your part, be a good steward and understand what's going into effect in your backyard, what you do daily, because it's literally everything rolls downstream. So, I mean, I, I hear all that and I, and I keep thinking, yeah, you know, there, there have probably been moments in my life that I should stop and 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 take a closer look at what I'm signing off on or moving forward with and do the research. Because in the grand scheme of things, I want to know that in the next 20, 30 years or that even my kids can enjoy the Florida that I've been so fortunate to enjoy, whether it's Florida or anywhere, you know, the Gulf Coast states, the Carolinas, this applies to anyone that's an enthusiast in the outdoors. So I, I mentioned paradigm shift because I feel like it is for some people to stop and think, okay, this is a lot bigger than just what, what I look at in the moment. Um, so I, it's good, good, healthy pause for anybody that's watching this podcast to, to listen and realize like you, you got to make good choices and you got to know what those choices are in the big grand scheme of things. And hopefully this will be a jumping off point to guide people to know where to go and to learn more about these decisions. I, I can even give you a more sportsman specific analogy that Cause you said that so well, but I think you can, you can even tie it more to a fisherman. And the way I'm going to do it is talk about cattle ranchers. And so I have a good friend. His name is Matt Pierce. Um, he's a past president of Florida Cattlemen's Association. And for a long time, you guys have been in this conversation for a long time. Agriculture or ranching has been demonized some in the conservation circle in, in just various circles. And when Matt was president, he came up with this idea of share your heritage, which is the idea that we want to open the gate and show that, yes, we are growing cows, but also we're exporting cows, which are exporting nutrients. We are leaving rough edges. So that's where the habitat where you see panthers and bears and snail kites and caracaras. I see those on private lands. I don't see them on public lands that much. Um, so he came up with this idea and he, he has said to me, a cattle rancher wants to close their gate and work their cows and live in their community. Like they go to church on Sunday, they have dinner on Saturday afternoon with their family. Like that's where they live that world. And that's, it's kind of insulated. It's kind of insulated. And until we open our gates as ranchers and start to invite people in and show them what we've got, we're not going to change this narrative. We're not going to change the story. And I, I talk about this a lot in hunting and a lot in fishing because hunters and fishermen are predisposed to want to go be away from people. We want to go on our boat with our two buddies and catch snook all day long and not tell anybody where we caught them. <laughs> We're going to blur out the background in our picture, but we, we have this in, we have this kind of insular idea in our head of as long as we can catch fish, as long as we can shoot ducks, as long as we can hunt deer, as long as we can, as long as we can do the thing we care about, we're fine with it. And metaphorically, we're closing a gate behind us. 
And we have to be okay opening that gate and sharing how that works and sharing, sharing our part of Florida, but also influencing the people that are influencing our part of Florida, which is where you get into local politics, which is where you get into, I can't tell you how many times in my life I've walked into the ballot box and I know who was running for president, I know who was running for governor, and then it all gets fuzzy. Yep. And in, in reality, those are people you can access, your state representatives, your your county commissioners, your, I don't know why you'd access a judge, but your judge, like, those are the people you can really get to and where you can have some serious influence. And if you can begin to talk to them, you may can push back on development or get concessions on development or make mitigations to development that help improve or impact your fishery, your bird watching, your what, your hiking, your stargazing. Like I talk, I talk in consumptive terms, the ideas of things you, you kill and eat fish or, or animals, but really conservation is way beyond that too, right? Like it's, it's the idea of enjoying wild nature and ensuring the proper use of it. That's what I want at the end of the day is to ensure that we take the proper use of these resources that we've been blessed with. Even going back to this referendum, the sad part is the majority of people who who have not done any research are going to see that. And and I'm just guessing they're going to read it and just it's going to say, hey, this is going to be an increase in my property taxes. I don't want that. But this and so they hit no instead of yes, instead of looking at it the other ways. Wow, this is going to raise how much did you say? How many millions it could raise about 300 million over the next 21 years, 300 million. To, to be able to get more places like Circle B. I mean, we're talking about buying thousands and thousands of acres for conservation. And, and yet, Justin, you nailed it. That one decision, this is coming up in November, right? That one decision could impact the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years when right now, a lot of us in Polk County here in Winter Haven, we're complaining how bad the traffic is and how much everything's just getting built. And these are the kind of decisions that can stifle some of that. Like you said, you're not anti-development, but it can actually protect at least some of these areas that are like, man, I hope that doesn't go away. Uh, so it is, it's, it's, man, it's massive decisions. And just like you, dude, you're in Orlando. I guarantee if you walked around downtown Orlando and interviewed a thousand people and said, Hey, do you, do you have any, or maybe, Hey, do you know that if you put something in the water right here in this like retention pond or down the drain in a sewer, do you have any idea that it's going out? Uh, I don't know exactly where it's going to flow from, uh, from where you are, but it's going out to the ocean at some point, it's going to have an impact on our redfish, on our stoke, on our trout. And I guarantee most people have no idea. It's tough for us to get behind that, that idea, right? Even in Polk County, we're dead in the center. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, it doesn't mind if I put an extra fertilizer here. It's never going to impact anything. But I, I've been told here in the chain of lakes, I mean, that overflow, that ends up going to the Peace River, right, which goes right out into Port Charlotte. I mean, all these little things that we're doing on a day to day basis as consumers and, and, and people in a community do have massive impacts. I'm, gl I'm glad you bought that water part. up. What, what is that quote again? That, that no, Leopold, it, yeah, it's yeah. not a direct quote. It's kind of a concept that he has. But if you take care of the land, you take care of the water. Okay. So, I mean, so if, you, if you really want to dig into it, he wrote a, a book called The Sand County Almanac, where he bought a farm and he grew over it. And this was back in the 30s. And you could take almost any Otto Leopold quote and apply it today. And it's completely relevant. He talks about the penalties of an ecological education is that we live in a world of wounds. That's really where we're at today because so much more information exists. None of us are scientists by trade, but we know so much more about fish mortality and impacts of fisheries and runoff and piney point and, and nutrient loads and everything else. One of the penalties of that is we live in a world of wounds. Now we can see all these injuries. So it's really hard to not get negative about it because you see nothing but badness when you look at it because you've got more information than our grandfathers did. 60 years ago, they knew it was a good year for snook or a bad year for snook, or there was a red tide or there wasn't. And anyway, I, I, I think if you, if you dig into Aldo Leopold, a sand County almanac, it's worth, you can download it and listen to it in the car in like four hours. Too cool. So like, besides, you know, the awareness, cause I think that's a big part of it, right? Just that no matter where you are in the Florida, and this is the same for all States. Uh, we're just talking about Florida. Cause that's where, you know, Travis is really involved in the conservation here, but that no matter where you are, even in Haines City, which again, which is supposed to be, if you try to put a like a, a, a little pin in the dead middle of Florida, that's it. Even what we're doing in Haines City, Florida, in the dead center, is having impact on our waterways, going bringing it back to the to the water. So, like, what are some of the conversations 
and, and maybe big issues uh, that, that maybe aren't making the headlines that we need to start talking about? Is there anything in particular like, man, I don't know why people aren't aren't talking about this yet. This is going to have some massive implications besides the obvious stuff that we already know. Well, I, I think I don't think it's necessarily the big headlines or big issues. I think it's more about the critical thinking. Because we live, Justin, you alluded, and I don't remember if it was when we were recording or before we were recording, but you alluded to the idea of how media kind of drives narratives out there. Yeah. And it's really easy for us to jump all over. Uh, okay. I sit on the Aquatic Plant Management Task Force for the state of Florida. So this is spraying. Spraying is a hot topic, right? It's really, really easy and sexy for everyone to say, stop spraying, you're killing our lakes. That's an easy narrative to follow. But I could take you guys to the University of Florida and we could meet with those people. And there's a lot more complexity to the idea of spraying. There's a lot more complexity to the idea of we all live in houses. We all have yards. There is runoff like you keep alluding to, uh, Joe. The nutrients that plants uptake that then have to be treated or managed is directly impacted by the number of people we put here. But those same people, hip hypocritically, myself included, because I've gone to plenty of meetings and yelled at FWC about this thing. Hypocritically, though, we are not looking at our impacts on the system. So I think there's not like a this is the big thing or that's the big thing. I think it's more at we need to look both at ourselves, at our impacts, at our existence as part of nature in a wild place. And we need to think critically about some of these issues, because if you if you really wanted to go way down that road. I could justify spraying in a lot of places. I could justify the ecological impacts of spraying to things like eelgrass restoration and to SAV or submerged aquatic vegetation and how that filters water better than a floating plant and a floating plant blocks out sunlight and inhibits growth. And then you get algal blooms and you could flip a lake. There's a lot to that. It's not as simple as hashtag stop the spray. And again, I, I don't want to say that in a reductive or flippant manner to yeah, anybody because sense. I appreciate people's passion, but I think. I, I said, I wrote this down far too often. We advocate for things we don't fully understand or fully grasp. Mm. Yes. Say yeah. that one more time. Say that one more time. Far too often. We advocate for things we don't understand or fully grasp. And I feel like we need to, we need to take it on ourselves as sportsmen to understand the issues more before we start firing off social media posts or comments or whatever else we're doing because there are impacts well beyond this. And Justin, you and I were talking before we started recording about the idea of single species management, which is the idea of if I closed down fishery A, if I said you can no longer keep bass, suddenly everyone's going to go keep bluegill because they want to keep some, some set of people want to keep fish, right? The concept of moving from one thing to the next applies to other industries too. Look at tackle. If you don't have the thing that you want, you're going to go for the next thing that's available because that's human nature you know, it, to have the best within the next best and the next best. And, you know, if we want to go way into economics on it, it's an invisible hand concept going way back to like Adam Smith in the 1700s. Like it, it exists in this world. This is not a, this is not a new phenomenon. We know it exists. I feel like we don't do a good job of really fully examining all the aspects of this and then becoming informed about the things that we need to, that, that we, that we care about. If I care about something, Man, I mean, Joe, I don't want to be reductive to religion either, but like you guys do on church as a, as a podcast alongside this, yep. I, I'm a Christian. I grew up in church. Like I, if you care about that, you, you read your Bible every day and you, you, you have these disciplines that you instill in yourself again, not being reductive or sacrilegious, but I feel like as sportsmen, as conservationists, as, as fishermen, as hunters, as bird watchers, whatever, we've got to instill some disciplines in our life to understand some of the things we care about because when Florida had 8 million people on it, you could be a lot more flippant about it yeah. with 21 and a half million people and fast approaching, you know, 25 million, 30 million. We've got to understand this world a lot better and be more involved and more engaged and more informed. Amen, dude. Um, besides your vote, wh what are some of the best ways to do that? And I got a second question too, but what, Oh gosh. You're obviously involved in it, and it takes up a lot of your time, right? Uh, and that, I think that's, and, and I've seen this and heard about this at all the, even just the FWC meetings, right? Is, you know, everyone gets vocal and irritated on social media and like two recreational anglers show up to the meeting. 
Um, and it's because of time. Hey, I can't take time off work. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why, but how, how, how do we get involved besides just awareness? Uh, what, what are some of the, the things that I mean, you're seeing like, man, I wish you guys just knew about this or just participated in this once a year. Uh, what are some things we could be doing? Well, I, I think one thing we could be doing is this is going to sound a little bit repetitive to something I just said, but I, I very much dislike the idea of mobs. And I think the world we live in is, is very um, conducive to mobs. Yeah. So we find a thing that sounds wrong to us. We form a mob and then we all yell about it. And then three weeks later, we find something else to form a mob about. Um, I'll pick on the fishing industry for a second. Everyone was pretty pissed off about Piney Point. You don't hear anybody talk about it anymore. Like, I mean, you, you do some conservation groups, CCA is still involved in that. Tampa Bay Waterkeeper is still involved in that. They, they haven't lost track of it. Yep. But the general outrage every day for two months, you know, you, you saw 68 people post about it. It's kind of gone. We forget about it. And we formed a mob. And then we went, and again, I'm trying to say this nicely. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, but I feel like we need to have some sticking power and some staying power. And that's hard. That's a discipline thing that we've got to, to institute into ourselves. The other thing I think is, I, I feel like I, I hate to be this predictive, but we, we have to go back to nonprofits a little bit and look at the guys that are in the rooms. So I've, I've seen CCA's praise on here. I don't know that I've ever been to a meeting that CCA wasn't at. Uh, not not necessarily on freshwater su- stuff, but man, you can you can go from Pensacola to the Keys, and CCA is going to have trip there or somebody there, Lisa there. I'm not saying CCA is the greatest organization in history world. I love them, obviously. I'm a I'm a I'm a fan of what everything they do, but I trust them. I trust they're going to be in the room. I don't always, always agree on their positions, but you know, I'm going to pick up the phone and call them and find out where they're at and stuff. So if you can't personally get involved, it's time, talent, treasures. Those are the three things we have. You can, you can, you can give your time, you can give your money, you can give your whatever you can do. If you build a website or whatever, you can get one of those three things. Some people have tons of time and they want to get involved in tangible stuff. There's some really good organizations out there that do tangible on the ground. Some people feel good when they go and pick up trash from a shoreline. You guys have done this before. I think Joe, like over in Tampa Bay, you go pick up trash and a Florida fishing product. Some of those guys have done it. I think that's a fantastic way to get involved and it's not marginal like that is a big deal getting out touching it seeing it cca does their oyster habitat or their ghost trap roundup or whatever i think that's that's a huge deal your talents do you have a skill that you can offer i actually had a guy so our nonprofit's called all florida i had a guy last week who's a data analyst reach out to me and he does data infographic things and analyzes data and we're working on a stuff with a with a federal bill and farm bill stuff and That's huge to me. I'd much rather have that than a donation or that guy is like, I need that his ability. If you build a website, if you're good with finances, where can you help these organizations out? And then treasures, obviously, if you want to, if you don't have the time, you don't have the talent, a good way to do it is to pay it. But those are organizations, uh, Dylan Hubbard, who we our mutual friend. Mm -hmm. uh, I see Dylan at the Gulf council meetings at the Atlanta council. Like he is everywhere. He's at FWC yeah. meetings. That's a guy I trust. He's going to be in the room. So when Dylan tells me a thing, I tend to believe him yeah. because he's always there. When trip tells me a thing, I tend to believe him because trips always there. Um, and I hope people feel that way about me. I'm always there. Like I want them to trust me because I'm always in the room and try to take a pragmatic thing. Delta waterfowl is a hunting organization. Stacy Woodham's their new hire in Florida. She's always there. And I just think that's important if you want to get involved, I think there are ways to get involved. I think there are ways to learn this stuff, but it's intimidating. And I tell people all the time, pick a meeting and go once a year, commit to go to one meeting a year. I don't care yeah. if it's FPC, a county commission. We haven't even touched on water management districts, right. but water okay. management district meetings, big deal. Um, pick a meeting and say, I'm going to take one day a year. You would take a day off to go fishing. You would take a day off to go hunting. You probably take knowing a lot of people listen to this probably take way more vacation time than you got and sick time to go hunting and fishing. (laughs) Um, But take a day and give back to the resource and you don't have to make a comment. You don't have to do anything. Just go learn how the process works and then say to yourself, you know what, next year I'm going to go to two meetings or next year I'm going to go to the same meeting, but I'm going to make a comment, but start to learn it. You don't have to go zero to 60. You can go zero to five and then five to 10. Like, like think of it more incrementally. We tend to think, Oh my gosh, we all kind of suffer a little bit from this hero concept complex. I want to show up and make a difference tomorrow. Showing up makes a difference. Sitting in a chair makes a difference. I've gone to FWC meetings before with 
25 people in tow and made my comments from the podium and said, all right, if you agree with me, stand up. And 25 people stood up and then they sat back down. They didn't have to go make a comment or anything else. There's a lot of power in that. And I, I just think getting involved is not as, it is intimidating. We always think of public speaking. We always think we're, you're walking into this room that's intimidating just by nature. It's usually a boardroom type situation with a lot of formality to it. Just go sit in the room. People will be nice to you. Like get past that, get over it. Stewardship matters. And we have to become, we have to become more involved. And to go back to my rancher analogy, we have to open the gates. That's opening the gates. We can't just go sit on the boat and catch fish all day. We can't just go sit in a deer stand and, and shoot our, our deer, or our ducks. We have to open the gates. We have to go get involved and, and tell our story outside of where we're sitting. That's good. Hey, back to the, the piney point, because you're right. Uh, we all got fired up and it was almost like as soon as the dead fish kind of went away and you started seeing bait back in that Tampa St. Pete region, it was almost like we forgot about it. We, it didn't, I don't think anyone forgot about it, but no one was animated about it. No one was, there's nothing to take videos of. It was almost like, oh, cool. Things are getting back to normal. Where, where are we with that? I, I've heard a lot of recent rumors uh, about there's a lot more to come. Uh, like, where are we just from your perspective and, and what you know? I'll, I'll give you my opinion. How about that? There you uh, go. That's fair. Um, I think nature heals itself faster than we give it credit for. So I think we tend to want to protect nature. And I think that's a noble belief. Like my, my tendency is I don't want anybody to keep a snook because I want there to always be snook for my grandkids to catch. But in fact, when there's a red tide event, there's still snook the next year. And we've had some really killer red tides in the past five, 10 years. Yep. There's still snook to catch. Like we catch 50, 60, 70 a night. So I think we, we over, we over protect nature sometimes, but I'm not saying that to say we shouldn't just take hands off. We tend to think in terms of binaries in, in this world. Um, so I, I think when you look at a thing like Piney Point, I, I would feel remiss saying I've heard it's going to do this or it's going to do that. Um, I think we're still seeing some nutrient fall out there. I don't know how drastic that is. I know that they're still seeing some, um, I can't remember what the name of that stuff is, but it's basically like a, a muck layer on the South shore, but the fishery, you know, I've fished the South shore and I've caught a lot of fish down there. Nature tends to want to heal itself pretty quickly. We didn't just, we didn't just invent fish gills last week. We didn't just invent any of this stuff last week. Yeah. Piney point was an egregious disaster and it should be punished. It should be like, I'm not marginalizing any of that. Yeah. But I do think, um, we tend to, we tend to not give nature enough credit for what she can do when she's allowed to, to, uh, do her thing. You, you well, use the word pragmatic. You're, you're just a realist and looking at the big picture again of everything, it, it, not one side or the other, but trying to play your own devil's devil's advocate. So you can have a better understanding of what's going on. <clears throat> and I can, I can agree with that. We recently are discovering, and I'm not trying to make like a, you know, Paul Revere mentality about it, but we're finding seagrass come back in Mosquito Lagoon, for example, and the Indian River system. Is it a light switch of, oh my gosh, it's better now? Is it black and white? No, but it's a sign forward and it does beg to question in light of five or six years of rough hardship, water quality issues to see a rebound in what appears like a light switch of a matter of a couple of weeks or months. Can nature repair itself faster than we realize? We don't know. We have a lot of information on seagrass regrowth, but there's still a lot of a lot of things we don't know. And I think it's okay to not know everything, but want to learn more about it. It, it helped, you know, kind of shape perspective for a lot of people over there of, you know, it, everyone's taking sides of we need to protect it. We need to not fish it or, Hey, let's go back. It's better now. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's much more complicated than that. I'm sure. And I'll, I'll be honest in admitting, I don't know everything, but at least I want to take the right steps to learn more about it. So we can, we can do better and be better. Perspective is so important in that. Um, I'll, I'll give you two quick things. One is Joe, I'm sure. Cause I know you had some corporate America time. Like I did back in the day, yep. there was a book back in maybe the two thousands called good to great that everyone read. It was like the book du jour. And it was this guy that went and examined companies that were successful and how were they successful and what he was kind of looking for. What was the magic bullet? What's the, what's the thing. And what he determined, the analogy he used was a giant concrete concrete wheel. And he said, it takes a lot of little pushes to get momentum going on a giant concrete wheel. As a nonprofit guy, from a fundraising perspective, 
big pushes are easier. Sexier things are easier to raise money on, to generate awareness, everything else. The fact is those boring little incremental pushes are really hard to do, but that's how you get momentum. And that's how you build a sustainable, informed community that understands what landscape conservation looks like. Um, the other thing that I'll probably get myself in trouble with talking about is look at manatees. You know, in the last year, we've seen a lot of outcry two years ago, I guess now a lot of outcry over manatee deaths, tragic 800. I love seeing manatees. I joke about them all the time, but I really love seeing manatees. Like you get clients, you have a slow fishing day. They love seeing manatees. They'll come up to the boat. They're, they're cute. They're cuddly. We call them charismatic megafauna in the, in the world that I live in. <laughs> but the simple fact is Florida has more manatees now than it has at any point in probably white history since, we, since Spaniards landed on the peninsula we have we, more we did a podcast on that recently but like so we tend to when one dies everyone gets very upset but if you take perspective into this manatees are really doing great i mean in the 80s there were like 600 manatees or 400 manatees now we're over 4,000. so it's a little bit of we don't want them to die because they're cute and cuddly and it's a bad picture and i don't want them to die either but conservation as a whole has that perspective. Like we, we tend to live in a world of binaries. Now there's no tolerable manatee death. Manatees do die guys. Like it, it, it's part of the world we live in. So yep. anyway, it's, it's a concept that I think more people could pay attention to is the idea of this is not as simple as it seems. It's way more nuanced. None of us are ever going to understand all of it. I do this on a daily basis. Like I said earlier, I'm not that smart. There's people way smarter than me and they will tell you, man, I just don't know how that works. I think that's good. I think that inquisitiveness is good though, that we want to keep challenging ourselves and moving forward on it. Yeah. So looking at this giant chessboard, because you're involved in this every day, you, and this is your opinion, is it, are things getting better, worse? Uh, we got momentum on that flywheel, I think is what Jim Collins called it. Like what, what, what is your gut? Like when you go home and talk to your wife you're like man we're screwed here in florida you're like man like the things are like are we're getting some momentum here uh wh where do you think we are right now i think maybe i'm bipolar on that because there's mm. days there's days <laughs> I come home and i'm like oh god we are we are done um i i think it's you play you and i were talking about sports offline a minute ago i played sports growing up and i always say this my coach would never walk us let us walk into a game saying man i hope we keep it close man, I hope we don't lose bad. Like that was not the right mentality. So I have to get up every day and tell myself, I'm going to save Florida. We are going to save Florida. We're going to make Florida better. We're going to improve this conservation. I'm going to partner with Tracy and Adam at Conservation Florida or the Wildlife Corridor folks or the ranching community or whatever. And we're going to figure out ways that as a team, we can win this game that is overwhelming because the kind of the opposition in all this is what generates more money, a house, like if we could continue to develop at an alarming rate, we could put 50 million people in this state. Won't be very fun to live here if you like to yeah. do outdoor things, but we could put 50 million people here and some people can deposit big checks in their banking account. Um, so I tend to look at it as there are little wins and there are lots of little wins that I think should be celebrated. And I think those little wins are little pushes on that flywheel. But I also tend to think I won't let myself... I, I'm not to say I won't throw a pity party, but I won't let myself, I won't let our team think about this in a losing mentality way. And I, I used to see this in the hunting community a lot where people would say, hunting's not going to exist in Florida in 50 years. So let's slow down that loss. Dude, that's a terrible idea. That's like saying, let's keep it close into the fourth quarter. No, man, I want, I want to go in and kick some tail. Like let's, let's go pick a fight and let's go win because if we're going to lose, let's lose now. Like I'm a game theory guy, Simon Sinek guy. I've heard you guys talk about him on the podcast before. Like let, let's, let's, let's be strategic about the decisions we're making, not just as a sportsman, because this is the other thing I really wanted to say on this podcast. My goal is not to create more fishermen. My goal is not to create more hunters. My goal is to create more conservationists and a conservationist good. views hunting and fishing as viable components of the landscape, a true authentic conservationist recognizes that those are practices that should exist on the landscape. But those aren't the only practices. It's not the only way. We used to say hunting is conservation or fishing is conservation. I'm not saying that's not entirely true, but I am saying 
a true conservationist wants to seek the proper use of a resource. So I want there to be enough resources so we can hunt. I want there to be enough resources so we can fish. I want there to be enough resources. So my mom, who's a butterfly aficionado can see swallowtails and monarchs and all like, I want it to be covered so that we are creating conservationists because I think that takes care of all of our other problems. If we can create people that are conservationists. Man. Well, I will say here, and we're going to take a quick vote between Justin and I, so if you can get 100% of votes, if DeSantis ends up going for president, I say that we nominate Travis Thompson as the new governor. Justin, you win. I'm down. You want well, my vote? We got momentum, baby. I'll put that into my polling data, and we'll see how it comes out. <laughs> That's no, good I've... stuff, man. It, it, it's... Uh... Man, it's it's spot on, and we need we need we need to hear messages like that. Um, it's so easy for us to have the good days where you go out there in the water and it is crystal clear, and you just think it's all good, and you have you know days where something like a fish kill happens or a red tide or whatever, uh, and we get all pissed off and think the world is is ending. And uh, and it, it is a shame that we we all kind of, including me, get on this bandwagon. We get so irritated, and I donate money like I donate money to the Tampa water keeters we have them on. And then, like, like you're right, we kind of forgot about. It. And I fished down there in Cockroach, and heck, we we caught fish right up there off Piney Point. And it's like, oh man, it looks beautiful. They're stuck everywhere, uh, and you you do tend tend to for, forget about that. And uh, it 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 is a it's a lifelong, just like if you're a lifelong angler, you need to be a lifelong conservationist and always be thinking about it, uh, talking about it is uh, as well. And even the day to day stuff that in the beginning of this, that was what hit me the hardest is all these small decisions we make as just consumers, right? And how we're treating even our own property or the property around us or public parks, uh, downtown. I mean, you said an ICAST, right? Even the stuff we're doing there, uh, we shouldn't just do it flippantly. I mean, it, 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 it has impacts across the whole state. And that's the same in Texas and same in the Carolinas. So this is awesome, dude. No, thank you. I, you guys pick up balloons. Do you guys ever see the, the, the Mylar balloons? Like that's I I oh, can't, out in the water you I mean I can't go three days without oh yeah yeah it's crazy yeah anytime I'm offshore there's gonna be a bundle yeah. from yeah. I, I can take you into the Everglades twenty miles from a road and if we drive around for fifteen minutes we'll find mylar balloons it's crazy that that that's just a little microcosm of like my sister will buy her kids mylar balloons and until I told her I was like this is litter it goes everywhere I don't understand. I understand why we're still selling them. And I'm, I'm not a big, I'm not a big censorship guy. I'm not a big, Hey, let's shut something down. And I'm not trying to get on a soapbox there, but I think we have a civic public responsibility to be better about this stuff. Mylar balloons being an avatar of that. Yeah. Amen. Uh, it's crazy. If you look for it while you're out boating inshore or offshore, the amount of trash you can find. I mean, it's crazy. And prior to moving to Winter Haven, we lived in Tampa, uh, it, right? It's where Luke caught that snook from the third floor balcony. That We live right there on Harbor Island, right where all the cruise ships come from. And so we were in one of those condos there on the water. And I, 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 if I did it every single Saturday that I was there, meaning picking up trash for three hours, it never would have, it, it, would, it didn't do anything. Like we, I remember we had a full day of picking up trash and we got most of it through the next weekend. It was already back. It was crazy how much that litter is just out there. It is so sad. Some of it is accidental, right? It flies off your boat, but I, I mean, I've flat out seen people. I've seen them in the lakes here in Winter Haven, just throwing beer cans and things they don't care about and Chick-fil-A styrofoam. It's just like, guys, what is wrong with us? It's, it drives me nuts. Aldo Leopold talked about the land ethic. I mentioned that earlier. I think every individual that is a user of wild Florida and however you use it, you need to create a conservation ethic that's you. I, I can't give you a recipe. I can tell I can tell you what I do, but I can't give you a recipe because what works for me, I have a different job. I have different times. I have different experiences. I have different, we're all individual humans. We're all individual people. But I think if I could challenge your listeners to do anything is to create your own personal conservation ethic. And maybe that means uh, I was challenged a few years ago by, by Tory Linder, Carlton Ward, those guys to get rid of plastics on my boat. I've never been a huge anti-plastics guy, but that's a small thing I could do was go in and buying, you know, metal water bottles and, and starting to good. It's a small thing, but it helped formulate part of my conservation ethic. And that doesn't mean I'm going to demonize you. If you hand me a, a Zephyr Hills bottle, when I get on your boat, that's yours. 
my convictions are my convictions and they shouldn't be a condemnation of you. So I think we need to all establish what our personal conservation ethics are and let that grow, let that breathe, let that kind of develop inside of us. And I think it, you would find it's infectious. It's a thing you want to be. It's a thing you want to be a part of is saving this place that we all inarguably love. You know, I, I hosted a banquet last week and I, I asked everyone to raise their hand if they hunted, if they fished, if they did this, if they did that. Finally, I said, raise your hand if you love Florida. 100% of the hands raised up because it's a special place. It's the most yeah. unique place in the world. And uh, I would just challenge people, develop your conservation ethic and find, find salts, reach out to these guys, reach out to me, like find somebody, if you need a mentor, if you need somebody to help, there's plenty of people out there that care about this stuff and can teach you what they know, what they think. We just need people to care and to yeah. care in a, in a measurable, tangible way from an informed perspective. That, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy, because even if anybody out there didn't otherwise think twice about their actions, if you ask them to just create their own guidelines, they'll immediately want to be better. I mean, everybody, if you just stop and think for a second, like, okay, I'm being asked to create my own conservation guidelines. But right then, someone might say, well, what's one thing that I can do better? Because that's the whole point, right? So, so it's, yeah, it's intrinsic to each person, but just asking yourself to be that just makes you stop. And the next thing you do is going to be a better decision anyways. T eight, 10 years ago as a fishing guide in Charlotte Harbor, I made a decision that no one on my guided trips was going to keep a snook. Now, personally, I like to eat snook. We take two a year when they're open. Like we're not impacting the snook fishery any more than we would with catch and release fishing. Yeah. But I made a personal decision that as a guide, this resource is worth more to me in catch and release than it is as a, as a harvestable commodity. I think that's your conservation ethic. And I've seen a billion guides do that on their own. No influence from anyone else. They've just established, you know what? I'm going catch and release only, or I'm going to reduce the bag used to be 15 sheep's head. I saw a number of guys that said, Hey, on my, on my trips, you can keep five per person. That's plenty of fish for you to eat. Yep. I think that's your own conservation ethic that you can establish. You can build. And I'm not just talking to guides. I'm talking to like whoever you are. I know people that don't take fish and freeze it. They only take fish that they can eat unless they're having like a community fish fry or something. They only take what they can eat like that day or eat fresh. That's a conservation ethic. Like build on that, dig into that and, and keep, keep growing it. I, I love that stuff, man. That's awesome, brother. Well, tell everyone where they can find you and, and hear more of your lovely voice on, uh, on the, on the podcast. Yeah. You can find our, our podcast at cast and blast fl.com. Um, or you can find, we will have a new one launching probably in the next two weeks at all fla.org. Um, that's our nonprofit. That's going to try and be trying to cover more of the chessboard, looking at the whole, the whole landscape. Awesome. Um, and then, you know, it, you can find me on social media at Travis Thompson. Instagram, Facebook, wherever. TikTok. Uh, I, I'm on TikTok. That's <laughs> I have a different handle there. I couldn't. There's a rapper named Travis Thompson. This is a little bit of a funny anecdote. There's a rapper named Travis Thompson who's been on like Jimmy Fallon, hmm. and so I've been tagged by Jimmy Fallon on Twitter because I have at Travis Thompson. That's, so that's hilarious. Pretty cool. Like I'm big time out there, but uh, I've not <laughs> generated any um, new hunters, fishermen, conservationists from that tag that Jimmy gave me, but. Uh, uh, Anyway, I don't remember what my handle is on TikTok, but I am out there. That's pretty funny, man. All right. Well, not to be confused with Travis Thompson, the rapper. Uh, that is pretty funny. Well, dude, thank you so much. We have to get you back on again. Um, I ended up reading uh, of what is it? It, it was the story of uh, now I'm completely, uh, completely blanking uh, Ray Scott. And it was the bass something. Um, but you know, Ray Scott started Bassmaster, oh, and, yeah. and, and you know, one of his quote, he was the guy that quote unquote said that these bass are too valuable to keep, you know, just once or to catch just once. And so he really kind of started that movement, uh, I guess, in the fifties and sixties about releasing them. And now, you know, it's it's almost weird to see people kept keeping largemouth bass. Well, and enough, we don't, we almost have too many bass in Florida now. We almost want people to keep bass. Crazy, right? Like we've gone full circle. Yeah, it's shifted over a couple couple decades. But he, you know, as he aged and uh, and 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 obviously had a ton of of support and obviously a group. I mean, Bass as as the membership and the club and the organization had like five to six hundred thousand members. So I mean, massive massive influence and impact. And he read a book. I believe it's called River Keepers. Have you heard of this? I haven't. 
Um, and he said it, it, it cause I, I just finished the, the book not too long ago of, of kind of his autobiography. And he said, this book river keepers was the most impactful thing he ever read. And I believe it was how they save the, the Hudson river. I, I, I have not read it yet. Uh, but it's a, it's a book about, I guess, how they saved the Hudson and a couple other big rivers that were basically to the point you could not swim in them. It was not safe and they restored them and all the steps they took. Uh, so it's, it was basically the blueprint on how to take a body of water that is, even though nature heals itself, that is completely damaged and looks like there is no possible solution to get it back to where it was and to reverse it. And uh, he said he read it and he was just like, man, it's all I could think about. And he went into like full on conservation, uh, really the last 15 to 18 years of his life based on this book. So I was like, I got to buy the book. So I just bought it. Uh, so I'll, 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 I might have you back on, uh, whether you've read it or not, uh, to, to discuss some of it. So I'm excited to read that here, uh, here next. So I uh, just, I just wrote it down. I'll, I'll have it. If it's audiobook, I'll have it read, you know, this weekend, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> cause I'll be a lot of windshield time, but no, I love that stuff, man. I think, I think that's fantastic. Take a, you've heard of your green pill or your red pill moment or your blue pill moment in politics. People talk about, yeah. I think people should take a green pill a little bit as far as conservation goes and, and yeah. kind of understand how that works. Yeah, I love it. Love it. Well, brother, thank you so much. This has been a great. Everyone, make sure to go check out Travis. And uh, and I think you've even had, didn't you have Kaylee from our team on your show at one point? I, I yeah, yeah. Kaylee is like my little sister. She's been on our show a bunch of times. A couple times, yeah. But if you listen to those, we had to bleep her out a lot. So yeah. just fair warning. She's awesome. Kaylee Dude, thank- is my co-host's sister. He's And I I grew up with her. So we, she's like my little sister too. But yeah, she works for yeah. you guys hopefully yeah. the job yeah she's she's awesome she's a rock star so yeah but she tells she's like well i did something this weekend or last week i was on a podcast and she goes i was so embarrassed i said something dumb and so uh yeah so everyone go check check travis out you guys do an amazing job thank you so much for all that you do for the the state of florida and uh and polk county too i mean just that one little tip hopefully there's enough people here that hear that and can share it with others right i'm going to just start talking about it and say hey on this here's what this really means for us it's not that you're going to spend an extra 30 dollars, which is nothing right on property taxes this is the the bigger impact the bigger implications that this has for all of us and our kids and grandkids so that stuff is powerful it's powerful well thank yep. you guys for having me i really appreciate you having me on absolutely <laughs> Been good, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, let us know. Obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can leave a comment down below. If you're on the podcast, go back to saltstrom.com. In the fishing tips section, you will see this podcast there. And at the very bottom, there's a place to leave a comment. It comes right to us. So we will be glad to answer any questions or thoughts or if there's any specific nonprofits that, that you think are, are really um, making a big impact, uh, let us know. And if you think there's any that... Uh, that are up and coming we need to know about you know let us let us know we're, we're always interested and in, um, and especially if it's anyone else we can interview to kind of share that story so appreciate you guys love you all and we'll talk to you on the next episode peace